Welcome to the Conversations That Matter podcast. My name is John Harris. We are going to talk today about the monument debate in the United States of America. In fact, I actually do hesitate, I should clarify, to call this a monument debate because it's not really a debate so much as it is uh, those who would want to take down symbols, uh, representations of heroes, artifacts of history from the nation's past or local history's past in the nation, uh, they are winning. <laughs> they are winning all over the place. And most of the time, uh, local municipalities are taking down these monuments, it seems like, without any kind of vote. Um, or if it is a vote, it's very quick. Uh, the public doesn't know about it. And before the public is informed, the monument is gone. Uh, it's happening on the state level. It's happening on, like I said, local level. Um, and, and then, of course, the, the events that get the most coverage are when mobs, protesters, vandals, etc., go into a community with the intention of taking down a historical artifact or a symbol uh, of some kind. And so uh, they're doing that, of course, uh, illegally, and they're not being punished very at least I haven't seen examples of people being published, uh, punished very often for it. So um, those who are like myself, who uh, love history and, and hate seeing some of these things taken down, uh, we, we feel at least like we're in the minority. Now, we may not be, but the conservative movement, if you want to even call it that, I hesitate to even call it that anymore, but the, the opposition to the left, whatever that movement is, is really split on this. And I'm going to explain that debate as best I can to you and why that dyna dynamic uh, exists. And I also want to talk about, as Christians and, um, and then conservatives, but Christians first, how should we think about what's going on? What about people that have flaws? Because everyone does. Every, I mean, as Christians, we believe every single person has sin, right? So what about honoring um, people and events or at least marking that, that an event has taken place in the history of a region? Uh, wh how should we navigate this? And um, I I'll say this right off the top. I don't think there's a silver bullet in all of this. In other words, I, I don't think the you, you can find chapter and verse, this is what the Bible says. You shouldn't remove uh, the Robert E. Lee monument because it honors the Lord, right? You're not going to find that verse specifically stated in Scripture. But what we do have are principles, like most things. We have principles that we can work off of. And I think we can um, come to a pretty solid understanding at the end of this video that what's going on is wrong. Big picture, I'm not um, big picture. Every, everything I've seen at least has been wrong. The way it's been handled, um, the reasons for getting rid of some of these things, uh, just about. Now, maybe you're going to try to come up with, well, look at this specific monument. Don't you think this one should be removed? I'm, I haven't seen everything, but everything that I have seen, um, I'm pretty comfortable saying uh, is has been evil, at least in, in the motivations being used to pull these things down. Now, that doesn't mean some people with good intentions are behind it, supporting it, but I think overall, there are those who brought this conversation up, those who want these things taken down, their intentions are not good. And, and so we're gonna get uh, into some of that. But before we jump into some of that, I do want to give you some announcements. Uh, announcement number one, uh, my wife and I actually went away for the weekend and had a great time. First in Tennessee, we were in Nashville for about, a, uh, I guess, two days total, and really enjoyed ourselves there. One of the things, this is actually related a little bit to this monument debate, but one of the things I noticed about Nashville is those who are new and up and coming in Nashville, country music singers, people that are trying to be country music singers, they kind of have a respect for the history of their genre. In other words, when you're walking down that, that main road in Nashville where there's all these you know honky-tonks and there's uh, all sorts of tourist touristy stores, which I went in a few of those. Uh, actually, I got some some gator boots. Uh, I, I love cowboy boots, and I, I only usually own a pair or two. And, and every single pair that I've had has been given to me except one. This was, I think, the first time I actually tried on a pair. Um, actually, second time. They're, they're, when I was 16, I had bought this really cheap pair for like 60 bucks or 40 bucks or something at an outlet in El Paso, Texas. I still remember though. They, they were actually very comfortable boots, but I, I, I ran right through those. Uh, but, but this pair that I got from Nashville is, is alligator. And um, those, as those who wear cowboy boots know, alligator boots are very expensive generally. And I got these for a steal. I mean, it was just, it, it was a great price and they, they look great. They feel good. And, um, and so I told my wife, I said, these are my birthday and Christmas presents right here. Uh, but I, I have now my, my brown pair of boots that, were, that was given to me by my uncle. 
and I have uh, have these alligator boots, which are more dark. And uh, some of you probably don't care about that, but it's related a little bit to what we're talking about because to me, there's there's symbolism behind even some some of the things I wear. Um, boots like that. I mean, I have uh, two pairs of boots. I, I have one. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. I have one pair of ostrich boots that were like 800 bucks. Um, one of my uncles uh, gave them to me right before he died. And I, I mean, I wore these things for years and now they have holes in them. I can't wear them. I still have them. There's sentimental value attached to these things. They remind me of my uncle. Um, I, I did so many things in those boots. I, I mean, they've been across the country with me. Um, I have another pair that I can still wear from another uncle on the other side of the family who also died right after he gave me the boots and, and their sentimental attachment that I have. And were my uncles perfect? No. Uh, were they always doing the right thing when they were wearing their boots? I don't know, but they remind me of my uncle and uh, both of them. And, and so I, I have an attachment to them because of that. And, uh, and so we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about sentimental attachment as we even talk about these historical artifacts that are being taken down. Um, but all that to say, getting back to Nashville, there's a respect for Hank Williams and Johnny Cash and, uh, you know, some of these old school country artists. We, we went to the Johnny Cash Museum while we were there, and, and my wife really enjoyed that. She doesn't like a lot of country music, but she really has a, I, I, a lot of people are like this. You know, they don't like country music, but Johnny Cash, you know, they like him. So my wife is a little bit like that. She liked Johnny Cash, and, um, and of course, I like most of it. So uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed um, our time there. And uh and, and it was nice seeing people who didn't throw, um, throw all, all tradition under the bus. I mean, I could still walk down the street and I was he hearing some folks playing songs like, you know, Country Roads and uh, He Stopped Loving Her Today and, and some of these older songs that, um, that I just don't know if other genres would tip their hat to, to the guys that were singing, you know, 70 years ago like country music does. But uh but that, that's what we experienced a little bit of, and, and it was refreshing. It was nice. And, um, but the reason that I was in Tennessee actually was, was because it was the closest airport Nashville was to uh, where we spoke, where I spoke in Kentucky, at Russellville, at Willow Creek Mennonite Church, and had a really, really good time with those brothers, uh, really generous people, really just down-to-earth, nice, humble people. Um, I, I just really loved uh, speaking with them, fellowshipping uh, with them, and uh, it, it, it was just, I, I had never been in a Mennonite church before, and so as I understand it, they're more, this particular Mennonite congregation is a little more progressive, and I hope I'm getting that right, but not progressive in a political sense, but more so as, uh, you know, they're not legalistic about necessarily what you should wear or shouldn't wear, but they have a Mennonite tradition, and um so I, I just really enjoyed my time there. They, these were some of the most kind, generous people, and they just really want to hedge against social justice. And so it was really good to talk to them. And so thank you for those out there uh, from the Willow Creek Mennonite Church and those who came from other places uh, to hear me. Uh, it was a joy. And, uh, and so that's why we were there. But we did spend a few days in Nashville. My wife enjoyed that. We have some friends there. So um, we, we visited with them. And, and I'll tell you what, I mean, look, they got country music, they got barbecue all over the place. I mean, it was 4th of July, so we saw fireworks, and I was kind of like, this is kind of, this is my speed right here. <laughs> I, you know, and of course, living there isn't the same, I'm sure, as vacationing for, for two days. But uh, anyway, had a great time. Um, one more announcement uh, before we uh, commence to the topic at hand. Uh, Judd Saul, the director of Enemies Within the Church, reached out to me while I was in Nashville and told him I, I couldn't really do anything uh, while I was there, but now that I'm back, uh, there there's a special uh, $25,000, as I understand it, $25,000 matching um, someone who's going to match donations for the film if you want to donate. So there's a matching donation. If you feel inclined to donate to the Enemies Within the Church film, which I know Judd really wants this to come out soon, and um, I, I think he's felt kind of like he's, been right around the corner from releasing it for probably the last year, but he there's just a little bit of money he needs to make up to be able to um, pay for the advertising. And, um, and so it, it's exciting. Um, there's some materials. I will tell you this, a little sneak peek. I have a book that I will be putting the finishing touches on this week that um, we're going to try to kind of incorporate with the release of the movie. And it's a history of how, how do we get here in evangelicalism? And so I've traced some of that. And, um, and so Judd, Judd would love it if you donated. You can go to the info section of this video and you can find Enemies Within the Church, uh, their webpage, and you can go there and give them a donation and it will be matched 
uh, up to $25,000. So uh, that's some good news on that front. And I, I think those are all the announcements that, that I have for now. So let's get into the topic at hand. We're going to be talking about history. And so I thought, you know, it, it would be good at least to talk a little bit about what history is before we talk about historical monuments. Uh, this is a definition by Dr. Clyde Wilson. And I, I really like this definition. I mean, there's others who, uh, I'm just going to tell you this if you want to go deeper on these things. Um, uh, John Lukash, I think, is a great historian to uh, to study. Uh, he, he understands historiography. I think Herbert Butterfield is a very good historian to study. He understands historiography. Uh, but uh, Dr. Clyde Wilson, I thought, had just a really good definition that not only tells you what history is, but contrasts it with really the spirit of the age. And I think he wrote this like more than 20 years ago. So uh, very appropriate for today, though. History is not, so we're starting with what it isn't. History is not an expression of abstract laws or the record of progress. It is a description of the actions of men, of life, which in turn is an expression of the partly unknowable mind of God. Let me read that to you one more time. History is not an expression of abstract laws or the record of progress. It is a description of the actions of men, of life, which in turn is an expression of the un partly unknowable mind of God. Now, what does this mean? Sounds almost uh, pantheistic, right? History, what do you mean it's the mind of God? He's not saying it's literally the mind of God. What he's saying is that they're actually, if you want to look at history um, as uh, the, way, the way that most people look at it today, a progressive understanding of history, you're going to look at history as a struggle, okay? It's, uh, and, and especially as you, um, during like Black History Month or Pride Month, you, you hear that word struggle an awful lot. History is the struggle to attain something, some abstract uh, principle of some kind, usually equality. Uh, inclusion, diversity, these kinds of things. So history is this march towards a goal. And uh, if you look back through the record, you're going to see leaps forward. You're going to see, um, okay, slavery ended. That was a leap forward towards this goal. Uh, women were given the right to vote. Hey, that's another leap forward towards this goal. Um, we implemented free public education. Wow. And it's on a federal level. It's well-funded. That's a leap forward towards this goal. Um, homosexual marriage is the law of the land. Uh, because, well, it's not the law of the land. The Supreme Court uh, declared it to be um, legal. So that's a, that's a leap forward in this understanding. So, so you know, a liberal-minded person in the United States would look at history perhaps that way. And we're just, everything is getting better. Uh, everything in the past is bad. And, and the better it gets, right, towards equality, quote-unquote, um, the worse the past looks. And so, um, you know, going back 300 years, I mean, that, that's, that's barbarism. That's, that's a horrible time of colonialism. And going back 200 years, we had slavery. That's, that's really bad. Uh, now, I mean, we're starting to rip down things from the progressive era. Like Woodrow Wilson's name has come off some buildings at an Ivy League school. So because he said very racially insensitive things, as a lot of progressives did. I mean, that was the time when Otabanga is in the Bronx Zoo. I mean, this, this was progressives at that point in time were very influenced by Darwinian evolution and they use that uh, to advance scientific racism. And so, so now that stuff has, a lot of that stuff has got to go. Of course, evolution is not, Darwinian evolution is not uh, seen as the evil, bad, you know, influence in all that. It's just, it's just white privilege. It's just these racists. But now, but now all that has to come down. So as we get more and more uh, closer to this goal of equality or equity, if you want to say that word, which is what they're using now, uh, we, we rip down more and more things from um, closer in the past. In other words, um, it, at this point, when does good history start? Is it 1970? Is that when we're finally, you know, the United States of America has dealt with the civil rights movement. So now we're, we're past that. Now we're not a racist society. Well, now you have to deal with the fact that it wasn't until, what, 2015, I think, uh, when uh, same-sex marriage was legalized. So if, if now we're going to go by that standard, well, I guess we were all bigots until 2015. And then, so, and, and so you see uh, celebrities and actors and, and people in the public eye who are apologizing for things that they did five years ago, you know, whether it's blackface or they just, they were just impersonating someone and used an accent or um, they said that maybe it's not good for women to serve 
uh, on the front lines in the military or don't ask, don't tell might have been a good policy. I mean, the list goes on. They said something considered now to be wrong and politically incorrect, and now they have to go do penance for it or be fired for it and canceled. And so, so, so that's what history is, right? This march of progress. Clyde Wilson saying, no, 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 no. That's not what, what actual history is. History is a description of the actions of men, of life. And in turn, this is an expression of the unknowable mind of God. So what makes sense of the actions over the past 500 years, let's say, 1,000 years, 1,500 years? What makes sense of the actions of men in that time? Well, there's a creator who made these men and the creator has a sovereign plan. And in, in, in this story of humanity, the creator's plan is unrolling. What the creator wanted to have uh, done, what the creator is moving towards is actually taking place. And there's good, there's bad, but, but the creator is the one that actually has, is controlling things in a sense. And, and I'm not talking determinism here, okay? Um, that's that's for another episode. We can talk about that that stuff, but but I'm I'm talking about just the fact that the creator has a plan, that things are moving towards some kind of conclusion, that there's going to be um, an eternal state, um, and, and of course, as Christians, we know uh, Christ is going to come back. He's going to set up a kingdom, and uh, we will rule with him. Those of us who are in him, and so and and there will be no shedding of tears, and uh, true justice will happen uh, after this life, but. But there is significance to this life because the Creator made it. And it's, it's more than just an opportunity to receive salvation. Uh, societies are built. Uh, cultures are built. Um, technology advances. There's all sorts of things going on. And th the Creator meant for these things to happen. That's the point, that there is some kind of... I, I think the, the best movie that gives a sense of this that I know of is uh, Lord of the Rings where you know, there's this scene where Frodo and Gandalf are, are sitting there talking to one another, and Frodo says, I don't know why the ring came to me. I don't know why all these bad, horrible things are happening. And, and Gandalf basically says, it's not meant for us to know all of that. Uh, we, we, we just we fulfill the responsibilities that we have, and we rise to the occasion, and we um, fulfill our duty in the best way that we possibly can for a higher purpose not knowing exactly how that purpose is going to be revealed or what it always is, but we know that purpose exists because there is a creator. There is a plan, okay? So this is what history is. History is, these are the actions of men, and we can't always look at those actions and know exactly what the creator was doing, but we know there is a plan that does exist. There is a purpose for these things. And, and we can look back in the historical record and we can study it, and we can tell the stories of men, all of them flawed, but all of them uh, representing certain things, certain qualities, some of them eternal qualities that we can then emulate. And so, um, so, so this is Clyde Wilson's understanding of what history is. And for the United States of America, uh, there's, a, there's a national history, suppose, you know, quote unquote, there's a history of the country, there's state histories, there's local histories, there's regional histories. And these histories tell a story about the people, the life in those areas. So that's what history is. Um, that's what makes history different in one place to, to another. That's what makes their cultures different, I should say, is that, hey, they have different histories, and these histories influence them in different directions. And it came out in their food and their culture and their political ideas and so forth and so on. So here's some scriptural uh, things I just wanted to consider here, uh, terms that you see throughout scripture. God of our fathers. Well, that's a reference to history. Whenever you, you see God of our fathers, we're, we're tying uh, our concept of God back to something in the past. This is the same God our fathers worship. There's a continuity there. So uh, there's continuity in history. In the fullness of time. You see that uh, phrase used quite a bit. There, there's a plan. There's, God had a specific time, in, in this sense, uh, when this term is, is most oft quoted, uh, when Christ came to the world. It was in the fullness of time. Is exactly when he wanted Christ to come. Psalm 78, 4 says this, We will not conceal them from, our, from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous, wondrous, wondrous works, there we go, which he has done. This is a psalm of Asaph, and he's saying that 
history is important here because we're looking back at the wondrous works which, what, past tense, God has done. History should be important for a Christian. Here's another one, Deuteronomy 32, 7 through 8. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of all generations. Ask your father, and he will inform you, your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of man, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. So, again, Deuteronomy 32 is saying this. Memory is important. History is important. And, and things happened within this, uh, this chronological narrative when God, the Most High, gave the nations their inheritance. He separated people. I and mean, this would get into to land, land boundaries, um, legal issues. I mean, you, you can't have... Uh, a, a law system, especially when it comes to property, if you don't have a history of some kind. Um, he divided people up. He set the boundaries of the people. So there's an importance given to history in Scripture. And, and this is just kind of, um, this is basic stuff. This is, this is something that's inescapable when you read the Scriptures because the Bible itself is a historical book. It's a historical narrative, so much of it. And, and God expects us to understand thousands of years of history to understand what he did, what his plan was for salvation and consummation. So here's some other things that uh, history can do. And this is, um, this is in regards to the scripture and the law of God, but it inspires righteous living. Now these things happen to them as an example that they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. 1 Corinthians 10.11 and then uh, Romans 15 forces this, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Spirit, we might have hope. So history can bring hope. When we're focusing on things that God has done in history, uh, it can bring hope. It can inspire. It can teach. Think of um, Hebrews and the Hall of Faith and these men uh, of whom the world was not worthy. These men are to be held in high regard, Right? So, so there's something special about certain things that happen in history. Not everything that happens is the same. It's not given equal value in Scripture. There are certain things that are valuable to remember and to, to make part of our memory. So why have monuments? What are monuments about? And I put a little picture of here of the Washington Monument and, uh, and the, the tip of it. Uh, this was the inscription that was put there. Los Deo meaning praise be to God. You think the Washington Monument is a little more than just George Washington? Or do you think there's something else going on here, maybe? Maybe there is. Maybe, maybe praise be to God says, you know what, this, this is actually bigger than just George Washington and who he was as a man. But he represented something, and what he did represented something, and, and people are thankful for that. Here's some scripture for you. Um, there are monuments uh, or you know, public physical acknowledgments of past historical events in Scripture. Uh, there's a number of them, and, and I'm sure I don't have all of them here, but here's a few. 1 Samuel 12, 11 through 12. The men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them down as far as below beth -car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen and named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. And of course, we all... Uh, probably know the song, Come Thou Fount, and there's this line, Here I raise my Ebenezer. And no one knows what an Ebenezer is, right? Well, here you go. Here's what an Ebenezer is. <laughs> it's a monument. It's a monument. He takes this stone and he's saying, This is my Ebenezer. Thus far the Lord has helped us. So this, this is an honoring to the Lord, physical marker honoring what the Lord helped them do. And it's, it's gratitude for a historical event. Here's another one. And Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder. According to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel, let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, Because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. So they're telling a story right now. This is narrative. When it crossed the Jordan. The, store, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. So this is what God did, but it's also about what they did. Here, here's something that they took part in. They crossed the Jordan. 
And these stones are the memorial to pass on. It's important to pass on some of these stories to generations to come. And a public reminder of those things, it, it gives you the opportunity to do that. That's why monuments are public, in public areas. So you, you go and you say, who's that person? What's, what's that pile of rocks? Uh, what's that obelisk? What, what's it there for? And then parents, and it's parents here, they get the opportunity to tell their children that marks when this happened. And their children learn. This is, this is really part of a culture. This is what makes a culture. So memory. So remembering the works of God. We're also remembering the works of man. And, and there's some negative um, examples in here as well. Then Joab blew the trumpet and the people returned from pursuing Israel. For Joab restrained the people. They took Absalom and cast him into the deep pit in the forest and erected him uh, over him a very great heap of stones. And all of Israel fled, each to his tent. Now Absalom, in his lifetime, had taken it and set up for himself a pillar which is in the king's valley. For he said, I have no son to preserve my name. So he named the pillar after his own name, and it's called Absalom's Monument to this day, Second Samuel 18. So this, okay, Absalom, not a good guy, right? And so he dies, and, and, and a monument is erected of, of sorts. Uh, a great heap of stones. This is where Absalom was killed, all right? So it marks the location as a significant event. And then Absalom, though, had already erected his own monument called Absalom's Monument. And you know what? They didn't rip it down, interestingly. It says it's still there to this day. So Absalom wanted to somehow honor himself. He didn't have a son to carry on his name. So he's going to put his name um, out on the historical landscape for people to see, I was here. Here's another one. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told Saul, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, then turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal, for Samuel uh, chapter 15. Saul's in disobedience in this passage, and there he is setting up a monument uh, for himself to honor himself. So, so there's something about monuments um, that also can designate honor. So it's not just the marking of a historical event, but there can be honor involved in this. So, hey, this is an event or a person that we want to remember because um, it, it shows us something good, something we want to emulate, something that we want to think highly of. And Saul thought highly of himself. And he was wrong, I'm sure, to do this. Um, and monuments can be erected for wrong motivations. It's important I say that, and we're going to talk about this, but there are wrong reasons to uh, erect a monument. One of the first ones that comes to mind is uh, there's a monument to Satan. I think there's a few of them now that uh, one I'm thinking of, I think, is in Oklahoma that was erected uh, outside of, the, I think it's the state capitol, but, but you can Google that. There's monuments to, to Satan. Yeah, not, not a great person to emulate there, right? <laughs> not, not, not someone we want to, you know, our kids walking down the street and say, hey, what's that monument for? And you say, well, that's a monument to honor Satan. And um, I mean, I guess you can explain to them who Satan is, but if it's depicted in a way in which Satan is being honored or Satan looks favorably sitting on a throne or something, well, that, that's a horrible monument. Um, but if it's depicted in a way of Satan's, you know, he's losing, he's, uh, or he's trying to tempt someone and, and beware of Satan, well, that might be a good motivation, right, to put up a monument. So motivation, authorial intent plays, plays a lot into this. But Saul, Saul put up a monument for a bad reason. Here's another one. This is from 2 Kings 23. Then he said, What is this monument that I see? And the men of the city told him, It is the grave of the man of God who came from Judah and proclaimed these things which you have done against the altar of Bethel. He said, and this is Josiah, Let him alone. Let no one disturb his bones. So they left his bones undisturbed with the bones of the prophet who came from Samaria. The situation here is Josiah is going and destroying all the, the pagan places of worship, idols, uh, the, the mystical um, places people thought were had mystical powers and so forth, where priests were buried. He's taking that all and he's destroying it, right? So is there precedent for destroying monuments? I think there could be at times, and we're going to talk about that, but, um, but he makes an exception here. He says, what's this monument for? And he says, oh, that's, this is a grave marker. This is where a prophet is buried. And he says, don't destroy that. And and then that's another key thing about monuments. They can also be markers for graves. They think, you know, how often do you go to a cemetery and you see some gravestones? I mean, every gravestone is a monument, but how often do you see big ones? You know, a lot of money was put into them. This is a significant person. Look at that big one over there. 
So these mark where someone has died, and it's to honor them often. So there's the works of man, the works of God. It's memory. Monuments are about memory. Um, they also can denote social obligation. Here's Joshua 24, 26 through 27. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law, and he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. Thus it shall be a witness against you, so that you do not deny your God. Do you think the stone really heard? No, it's a stone. But it's symbolic. He's saying this stone was present when we heard the words of the law. And it's going to be a witness. It's going to say, when we see that stone, we're going to remember, oh yeah, we were there. And we remember the oath. And we remember the obligation we have to obey the Lord. That stone's a reminder. It's memory. And this, in this sense, it's memory to a social obligation. Who we are as uh, nationally, as Israelites, who we are as followers of Yahweh. This is our obligation. And so... We have this today. I mean, it's unfortunate so many churches are getting away from this. They, they don't like steeples. They don't like crosses. They don't like anything that would remind you of death, like a graveyard. They don't like to look like a church. They want a little corporate logo. They want all their songs to be super new, not written by old dead guys. I mean, tradition's just kind of thrown out the window. But churches used to, and there's still many, they had these big steeples. It was the tallest building in the town because you know why? That's a monument. You look at that and you say, that's the house of the Lord. That's what that represents. I'm reminded that there's a creator and that there's a law and that this is who I'm living under. It was a social reminder for social obligation. Who we are as people, who we are as individuals, um, who's in control, who should get honor. And, uh, and of course, because they were the tallest buildings in the town, lightning often struck them as well. Monuments are also used as landmarks. And we can see this today when... Uh, sometimes if you're in a town where there's a monument, I know I grew up down the street from a place where there is this World War II monument. And sometimes people would say, where do you live? And I said, well, I'm down the street from the World War II monument. Oh, it's on the corner of, and I told them the streets, and they'd say, oh yeah, the monument. So monuments are used as markers. And here's uh, an example of that from Genesis 28 and Genesis 35. In both cases, um, Jacob named a place Bethel that had previously been called Luz. And it was to mark events that took place. Uh, the first one, it says Jacob arose early in the morning. He took the stone that he put under his head and set up a pillar and poured oil on its top. So is when Jacob has this vision. And then the second one is Genesis 35. Uh, the Lord talks to Jacob and he puts a pillar in the place where he had spoken with the Lord. And so this is to, to a holy place in a sense. This is a place that's different. This is a place where Jacob uh, talked to the Lord and received some kind of revelation. So... Uh, it's an important place, and it's also a landmark. So he, he renamed the, the region. And we, I mean, this, every, you pull out a map, every town that you see is a monument to something or someone. I mean, how many, I grew up in the Northeast, how many places in the Northeast uh, are also the names of places in England um, or, um, or old you know, Native American names? So uh, it represents something or someone. It's a landmark, often. Now here, I want to give you a little bit of my thinking on monuments in general. This is kind of just the grid that I use. And I, I start with this G.K. Chesterton quote, don't ever take offense down until you truly know the reason why it was put up. This is Ch Chesterton's fence. Conservatives love using this. And they say, look, this is how tradition works. I mean, if you want to, if you want to change something, if you want to take something down, that's fine. But you better know why it was there in the first place. Maybe there was a good reason for it and you just haven't thought of it. Uh, and so maybe you should get back to authorial intent. So G.K. Chesterton pushes us, us back to authorial intent and applying this to the monument debate. What, what's the reason that monuments were erected in the first place would be the question. Why are there monuments? What did the originators of these uh, monuments want to communicate to those who would admire them or not admire them? Well, you have to go back to what the erectors, what those who were dedicating them, what, what they thought of. What did they say about specifically uh, the monument itself? Not what did they say in other places, not what rabbit trails did they go down in a speech about the monument. No, no, no. What did they say about the monument? What did it represent to them? So that's very important. Uh, tradition. So um, tradition is another thing I look at. If it's been there for a long time, and this is something that not a lot of I don't know if a lot of people think about it this way, but uh, if a monument to a, 
historical event has been there for a certain length of time, let's say 100 years, it's no longer just a monument to that historical event. It's a historical artifact itself. I do believe that. So when you're taking down um, monuments to Christopher Columbus or to Robert E. Lee or to Thomas Jefferson and these monuments, let's say they're newer, quote unquote. Oh, they're only 100 years old. Well, 100 years is, you know, that that's a long time for that to be standing there. A lot of generations have come and gone. Um, the United States has gone through several wars. Uh, we've, I mean, a lot of events have taken place while that monument was standing there. So it's actually part of the historical landscape. It's, it's part of the memory of people who have grown up in that area. And that's why it's so hard for some people who have grown up, let's say, in like Richmond. Uh, I've talked to some who they can't believe all these monuments they grew up with are coming down. It's like it's like it's not even the city that they grew up in because they were so used to these things. It's part of the historical landscape. Uh, depiction. That's another, I think, area to look at. So depiction. What is the monument depicting? And I, I just use the example of Satan. Like if it's Satan and Satan's in a subservient position is being conquered by God, or if Satan's trying to tempt someone and it's a warning about temptation, well, that's one thing. But if Satan's sitting on a throne, well, that says something about Satan that's not true. It's a lie. The monument itself is a lie. It's telling people that Satan is the one in control. He's the ruler. And, and, and I guess, you know, I think the one I'm thinking of has, I didn't put a picture of it. It's offensive. I don't even want to put a picture of it up, but I think he's got a boy and a girl with him. And saying that Satan, yeah, Satan's not a threat. Satan's powerful and he'll help boys and girls. That's wrong. That's a bad message. And it's because of the way Satan's depicted. And so a, a depiction is very important. How are these people depicted? If it's, uh, let's, let's talk about racism for a minute. Let's say it's someone who's a racist, right? Are they depicted as a racist? Are they doing something racist? I mean, if it's someone who's, let's say they're beating up some minority. Well, yeah, that would be a racist monument, wouldn't it? But if it's someone who uh, is known for exploration, like Christopher Columbus, and they're just, it's just, a, they're standing there and they're, they're dressed like an explorer. And um, it's probably talking about or referencing the fact that this person made, uh, had an accomplishment. They explored, they discovered the new world. It's not a, a, a dedication to the racism or the misogyny or anything else of Christopher Columbus that he might have had. Uh, it's it's specifically about his contribution in this one area. Okay, people can't seem to make these separations today, but that's another another barometer I use when I look at a monument. And then human scale. Human scale is another thing I look at. Now, human scale. Um, th this would be like like Soviet monuments. Think of the the communist monuments, big in human scale. I mean, it's showing Stalin as a god essentially. Um, in our country, the closest I can think of would be like um, maybe the Abraham Lincoln or uh, Mount Rushmore might qualify. Although Ma Mount Rushmore, they're just busts. Uh, but at the same time, that is a big human scale. But Abraham Lincoln is more, I mean, it's a big, it's a big monument. Um, and, and you feel small next to it, right? It's supposed to evoke some kind of awe that, wow, wow, look at this. Um, this person was larger than life. Now, I, I, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. What I'm saying is I think that is a barometer to look at. So how, what, is it, what kind of feelings does it evoke? Does it make you think this person is, is a god? Uh, I think a lot of the communist statues were meant to make you think that because they were atheistic and they, that their, their culture, their, their government, I should say, they got rid of God. And so in God's place were these monuments to the revolution, monuments to uh, figures of the Soviet uh, state, and they were God, essentially. Um, so the human scale tells you that, and, and also the posture that they held. Uh, a lot of the monuments to soldiers and so forth that are up on pedestals, they're saying, yeah, this is someone to emulate. But if you usually look at them, the human scale is not, it's not incredibly huge. Usually they're a little bit bigger than than normal human size or the size of a normal human, but usually a little bit bigger to tell you this is an important person, but they're not show, they're not trying to communicate that this is God, okay? So this sounds a little subjective, but the intention of those who erect monuments, uh, I think comes out in the size, the scale, the scope, the depiction, all of these things. And so these are some of the, the things that I look at when I'm trying to judge in a monument. Now, I want to talk about what's going on now, because the, the, the people that are taking down these monuments today are not looking at these barometers to determine whether the monument is good or not. They're looking at other things. And I'm going to read for you some things here. I want to first read for you a quote from George Orwell's 1984. This was written in 1949. 
George Orwell said, Every record has been destroyed or falsified. Every book has been rewritten. Every picture has been repainted. Every statue and street building has been renamed. Every date has been altered. And the process is continuing day by day and minute by minute. History has stopped. George Orwell in 1984 recognized something about totalitarian regimes and what they could or would do. He just lived through World War II. He had seen and he was watching the rise of communism in Eastern Europe and in Asia. And this is what he's seeing. And he's writing this. And he is, he, he is noticing the, how these totalitarian regimes uh, erase everything, all the memory from the past. And they start at year zero. I mean, that's what the French revolutionaries even did. We're starting a new, a completely new system. We're going to have a 10-day work week because we don't want any attachment to what came before us. We want to erase those things. We want to liberate ourselves from the past, from those attachments, which you can never do. <laughs> it's a lie to think you can do that. But that's what communist revolutionaries have always wanted to do. And so George Orwell, Orwell is watching this, and he's saying that this is the logical outcome. This was what would happen. Kind of prophetic. We're watching it happen in our own country right now. Here's Richard Weaver in Visions of Order, 1964. He said, amnesia as a goal is a social emergent of unique significance. I do not find any other period in which men have felt to an equal degree that the past either is uninteresting or is a reproach to them. When we realize the extent to which one's memory is oneself, we are made to wonder whether there is not some element of suicidal impulse in this mood, or at least an impulse of self-hatred. This is a fascinating quote to me. It's fascinating because what he's saying is that uh, he recognized humans have an attachment to the past no matter what. You, you always do. There, there is, you, you come in a sequence of events that came before you and there will be a sequence of events that come after you. And part of who you are, whether you like it or not, the language you speak, the clothes you wear, uh, the kinds of things you're interested in, the food you like, everything. Uh, even, I mean, and I'm speaking culturally here, I'm not talking about someone who loves the Lord truly because the Lord has has done a work on, on their heart. Um, I, I think the Lord can do that no matter where you are. He can use means to do that. Um, he can send missionaries, even if you're in a place that's unreached. But so, someone who's a cultural member of a religion, cultural Christianity, cultural Buddhism, cultural Islam, that's determined by where you're born, really, more than anything else. Those who came before you, what were they were like, the culture you're growing up in. So Richard Weaver's saying, you're a product <laughs> in some ways. You want to liberate yourself from all that and say you're your own person. You're not. You, there's influences. And to get rid of all influences and all, everything that happened in the past, to try to either forget it, so amnesia, to remove it from your sight is an exercise, he says, in self-hatred because that's part of what made you who you are. That is so prophetic. That is exactly what is happening in the United States right now. These things made us who we are. These things that we're ripping down, it's part of our story. There's a hatred, uh, I guarantee you, when you talk to these protesters, there's a hatred for the United States as it is today. It's not just a hatred for what it was. It's a hatred for what it is. I guarantee you that's what's motivating this. So Richard Weaver, very interesting quote. And then here's uh, from Russia Beyond, February 12th, 2012. When the Bolsheviks came to power in 1917, the first thing they did was to start destroying monuments to the czars and replace them many times over with the monuments to communist revolutionary heroes. This is what communists do. Here's uh, from China's cultural revolution. Here's what Mao did. Mao felt the same way. We got to get rid of especially uh, Buddhist, Buddhist statues and not for the reasons a Christian might want to do that. He felt like the past, China's past, was keeping it back from entering the new, the brave new world. And so they destroyed tons of stuff, burned up statues, um, destroyed artifacts of all different kinds. And you can look up that more if you are interested in, in learning more about it. So here are some assumptions. And, I, and I, before I get into this, actually, I, I want to sort of set this up. Here's what's happening in the United States right now. I'm going to get deeper into it, but I want to give you kind of a basic understanding. There are two competing understandings. Actually, there's three. There's three competing understandings of what the United States is and what its history has been and, and what its history is. So 
Number one would be, this is probably more the camp that I would be in, but uh, the United States history includes good things and bad things. And it is the story of people who have come together who God has Im blessed immensely. And he's blessed the United States immensely, not because the United States is so good, um, but because the United States uh, in general, there's exceptions, but in general, they follow biblical principles. It's ingrained in many of the laws, uh, taking into account things like man is evil, so separation of powers, local, state, federal authority, um, the, the idea that a free market is good, self-government is good. Uh, nine of the 13 states at the founding of the country had their own state religions, essentially, so there, and there's always been an acknowledgement, even on the federal level, uh, of God. And so that there, it, it's been predominantly a Christian nation in the sense that Christ, there was a Christian influence, not that everyone was a Christian. But Christian ideas influenced the formation of, of this country. And this country is really an extension of, uh, originally, of uh, Great Britain and European uh, ideas. So it, it was a federation. It came together. And God has, has blessed this country in many ways. There's been hard times. There's been good times. And we look back and I think we can see uh, things to be proud of. We can see things to be ashamed of. But overall, the big picture is, wow. Look at how much freedom we've enjoyed in this country. Um, look, and, and what's the reason for that? It's because most of the people in this country had certain understandings of, uh, of God, who he was, the Ten Commandments being good moral principles to exercise. Uh, they, you didn't have to pay for a lot of protection and police and things. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, um, even, which wasn't that long ago in the 90s. I mean, I could, um, or in the early 2000s, I guess, yeah, I, I would go in the neighborhood and mow people's lawns and talk to people. I didn't have a cell phone. My mom just knew I was out in the neighborhood. I mean, that those days are gone in most places. But there used to be an understanding that um, most people are going to treat you the way they'd want to be treated. And, you know, this was, this was just part of the culture. Christianity really flavored everything. And, and so there's, there's a lot of things to be proud of. There's an emotional attachment that I have to this country that all of us uh, who are Americans probably have in some way, shape, or form. Um, and so we can see uh, the way this country was formed, the reasons it was formed, people escaping uh, from Great Britain or other places to flee religious persecution, people wanting just opportunity and finding it in the United States. And, and we're proud of, of what this country has become. And, and, and so that's, that's the America that I would say, the, the American history that I know about, that I am used to, right? Well, there's another competing narrative that says this country stinks <laughs> from the beginning this is like 1619 project from the beginning it was just oppression against against black people against american indians against women against just the list goes on children who had to work in factories um it, it's just a story of horrible oppression and um that's what the country is that by definition and so the country has uh, gone through a series of changes that have been positive but we're, we have so much farther to go we just we're not there yet and so we need a real revolution to stop the hegemony to stop the allocation of resources and privilege to those who are white straight males etc because they were the ones who designed this place to benefit themselves that's the other story of history and so we're constantly uh, in a state of revolution constantly putting everything under the microscope to get rid of any semblance of what was there at the beginning constantly trying to um, emancipate ourselves from the past, all right? That's the left's version of history today. It's communist version of history, right? Then you have, I'm going to call it the neoconservative version of history, if you want to call it that. And the neoconservative version of history pretends to be just like the first one, I'd say the traditional American understanding of what America was, is, has been, but it's not. It's actually closer to the revolutionary history because what the neoconservative version of history says is that the, yeah, the founders, you know, they, they were good guys, but it reads the founding through the Emancipation Proclamation and through the formation mostly of the Republican Party. And so they were dedicated to abstract principles like equality. So this wasn't just families moving over from Europe, taking the traditions from Europe and planting them here in the United States and forming this great country. No, the United States was, was starting at square one that, in their minds. It, it was the, it was a, you'll often hear them say the American experiment. It was an experiment. 
uh, because they're starting something brand new that's never been tried before. Now, that's not really exactly true. I mean, there's every, some things unique about every country, but, but th these were traditions taken over from other places. It, it wasn't, the 13 colonies weren't all unique in every single way. Uh, in, in the sense that they were starting a new political experiment. No, they, were, they had ideas already from Europe. But this neoconservative version says, no, everything started at square one, and we were dedicated, as the Declaration says, to the principle that all men are created equal. And that's what the United States is about. It's about equality, which, of course, Jefferson wasn't trying to say that. It wasn't a scientific statement. It wasn't an abstract statement. It was more of an artistic flourish. And, um, and of course, he is a man who uh, owned slaves. He wasn't talking about flatlined equality uh, in any sense of the word. But, but this is the understanding that the neoconservatives have of the founding. And then what they'll say is the Republican Party was the party that started to oppose slavery. And the Democrats from that point forward are just the bad guys. Uh, they were the party of slavery, of Jim Crow, of KKK, of uh, against civil rights. Um, and, they, and that's who the Democrats are. And they're still that way. They're socialists. They're evil. They're awful. And the Republicans are the good guys. And they're the, the knight in shining armor through the whole story. Now, the problem with that story is it doesn't actually, it's not true. The historical record doesn't bear it out. Um, the, the Republican Party was mostly formed. Uh, one of the reasons was for free white labor in the West. They didn't want black people in the Western territories. They wanted it for white people. And of course they wanted, it was an extension of the Whig party in some ways, but they wanted Henry Clay's American system, infrastructure projects, the railroad. Uh, they wanted government intervening. This is where you get more state capitalism. They like the idea of a national bank. I mean, this is the Republican party. They did not start off in, the, in a conservative way in, in every sense of the word. And of course, this is the same party that uh, it was under Republicans that the Native Americans were wiped out by federal troops in the West and put on reservations. So they don't, don't think the Republican Party is this pure as the driven snow party when it comes to the issue of, of race and ethnicity. The Republican Party has some of the same issues the Democrat Party has. In fact, in the progressive era, uh, they, were, they, they were racist just like Democrats were racist. I mean, progressives were we're mo mostly championing racism during that time, uh, both parties. And so, you know, if you look at the Democrat Party, you're actually going back to the Jeff Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson stands in that line. All right. So it's not it's not a black and white thing. But in this version uh, of the neoconservative history, what it allows them to do is to vilify those on the left. So, so they're playing identity politics. The left is playing identity politics. The left is saying we need to emancipate ourselves from all the history. We need to just start square one. And there's, there's a few people who got it right, like Martin Luther King Jr., but overall, you know, most people were wrong. And so we're going to honor those few people who got it right at different points in history, but we're going to, most of it just needs to be destroyed. And the Republican Party comes along and says, no, we're going to save it by blaming you guys for all the problems. We're going to blame the Democrats for all the problems. And, and we, don't, we shouldn't honor Democrats. Now, this has been the logic used to, for, for both sides, for neoconservatives and for, um, for, for Democrats, for liberals, to destroy Confederate monuments. And anything that would, uh, would be you know, honoring the Confederacy or honoring an event related to the Confederacy, both of these guys got together basically and said, yeah, you know, we can agree on this. And they're for different reasons. <laughs> the neoconservatives, Republican Party, yeah, because they're Democrats, slave-owning Democrats. And the other side, the um, the liberals, the communists, the Marxists, they, they want to wipe that out anyway. But they don't want to stop there. They want to wipe out everything. And so I think this is, I'm, I'm going to talk about why I think this happened. But, but the effect of this has been the Republicans have adopted this neoconservative version of history and they can't defend now, they, they don't have any logical reason to defend American history as a whole because they gave up the battle. And I, I really think that this, the failing to defend the Confederate monuments when they started be becoming under attack, I think is a failure. Just like when conservatives gave up the gay marriage debate. They gave it up, they said, okay, you can have that. And the, the lie was, well, if you give us same-sex marriage, if, if you allow that to happen, it's going to end there. Um, it, we're not going to take anyone to jail. We're not going to you know, force any kind of you know, laws to, to force people to hire um, 
homosexuals. We're not going to come into your church or anything like that. Or, but now what, what do we see? Of course that wasn't true. That was a lie. Now it's, you know, bake the cake or else, or, you know, photograph the wedding or else, or recently in the Supreme Court, uh, you have to hire someone who's transgender. Um, and, and if they become transgender after you hire them, you can't fire them, even if they want to display that. Uh, and I think the case that had gone through was a funeral home. And it, this is the most sensitive time of some people's lives. And an employee wanted to do cross-dressing. And they said, this just isn't helpful for the people that come in to mourn. And the Supreme Court says, it's too bad. It's discrimination. Well, if we could have gone back to 2015, what, how many conservatives would say, yeah, you know what? Maybe that wasn't a good idea. Maybe we shouldn't have exited this battle. But they did exit this battle. And I think it's similar in, 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 when it comes to the monument debate. 2015, when these monuments started really started to be under attack, Confederate Southern monuments, etc., neoconservatives, uh, Republican Party wanted to say, all right, you know what, we'll give you that. Well, you can take those down. That's fine. We're not going to say much about it. Um, but they didn't realize when they gave them, when they, when they allowed them to have that logic, they also gave up the founding fathers and anyone associated with colonialism and anyone who was a bigoted, you know, misogynist, etc. Uh, they, they gave up most of American history when they allowed them to use that logic because that logic was going to be used over and over and over again. And that's exactly what we see now. That's why I don't have a lot of sympathy for Republicans who now want to all of a sudden draw a line and say, hey, hey, hey not Thomas Jefferson. Don't, don't take him down. Hey, Christopher Columbus, don't, you can't do that. Hey, Frederick Douglass, you keep, no, don't take him down. I don't have a lot of sympathy because these are the same guys who a few years ago were, were like, yeah, whatever, take down those Confederate monuments. They gave up the battle then. And so I'm going to explain this. We're going to go through this. Here, here's some of the logic that was used uh, to take down the Confederate statues. Uh, the country was split between two parties of Americans during the Civil War, right? But the accusation is that the Confederate leaders, they're not Americans. So as long as we can take down statues of people who aren't Americans, then yeah, the Confederate ones can go. But in some ways, this would actually, any figure who predated uh, the Constitution, were they an American? I mean, how do you, con what's an American then? Do, is there, is there a Native American monument anywhere? I mean, they weren't part of the United States of America. Do they need to be taken down? Or are local regional histories also part of the American story? Remember, the traditional American historiography, the way of looking at history, is that these, the accumulation of human experiences, including regional histories, is part of the American story. That's what I subscribe to. The neoconservatives don't. They subscribe to this abstract understanding of those who forwarded equality are worthy of honor and part of the American story. And that's the Republican Party. So they gave it up right then. Um, but, but I contend, no, wait, hold on. Uh, I think Native Americans should be, you can have a statue to a Native American. I think that's fine. I think people who are explorers who were here before the Constitution, before even the Declaration of Independence, yeah, they're, they're Americans in a certain sense. They're part of the regional history. Um, and, and the same would include the, uh, those who were Confederate leaders. Um, before the war, most Confederate leaders had a conflict, were, were leaders in the United States. Think of Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee was responsible in large part for winning the Mexican-American War. That's Robert E. Lee. He would be a hero whether he fought for the Confederacy or not. He, would, he could have a statue to himself that he's, that's an American hero, whether or not he had any attachment to the four years of civil war. But, um, but he's not acceptable now because he has that attachment. So the other thing is that um, the country, North and South, included CSA leaders, including CSA leaders, were reunited. So in other words, um, Abraham Lincoln was operating under the assumption that these, these states could not legally leave. And so they were always part of the United States. And when the country was reunited, uh, you'd have dedications to these monuments where Union ex-Union soldiers would be there and ex-Confederates would be at Union dedications. And this was part of the healing and reuniting and saying, you know what, we're Americans now. We're going to honor Abraham Lincoln. We're also going to honor Robert E. Lee. They're both heroes and we're coming together. And so that that's the the America, that's the uh, that that's the logic that's been employed now for the last, you know, since the war ended, really, uh, to defend and to justify Confederate memorials as well as Union memorials. We, we come together as a people. 
Any monument or symbol honoring native tribes, like I said, or pre-United States era figures or cultures should be also destroyed under this logic that well, we just honor you know, true Americans. Um, the other accusation is these are monuments to racism. And, and here's the issue with that. The interpretive plaques that express, express intention to honor leaders and soldiers, so not government policy. Uh, so if you go to these monuments, a lot of times they'll have plaques. I'm going to show you some of those. But um, they say to, to, to home, to hearth and home, to those who didn't come back, uh, those who made the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, it's to intangible things like honor that these monuments are set up. And so... Um, so, so the interpretive plaques, authorial intent tells you what these things actually mean. What did the authors mean? What did those who created them mean? What, were they setting these things up for racism? No, that's not what they said. So why, why should we put words in their mouth? The United States policy had the same problems, by the way. So by this logic, uh, early U United States heroes should also be canceled because, and this is the logic being used now anyone who had a racially insensitive understanding or now it's going to it's going to eventually go into uh, they had an understanding that was misogynistic in, in the minds of the social justice crowd or uh, anti-homosexual etc you know these guys th their monuments aren't to the accomplishments that the monuments are honoring it's to uh, their personal views on these specific issues and this is the logic that's being used to take down Christopher Columbus and all the founding fathers, et cetera, et cetera, that, you know, they had, they had other views that we wouldn't have agreed with today. And that's not what the, why the monuments are there. We're not honoring Thomas Jefferson because he was a slave owner, but that's the logic used by the other side to rip them down. These are, must be monuments to slavery because Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. Um, it's kind of absurd. That, that's like saying, you know, even if we made a, a monument to MLK, you know, is every street named after MLK um, honoring adultery? <laughs> no. We would say, no, we're, we're honoring him because of what he did in the civil rights movement. We're not honoring him because he ran around on his wife. But by the logic of these guys, you could say that. Why not? Why not take it down? So um, I, I want to take you through some of this because I, I think we need to draw a line. And I draw my line at the Confederate monuments. I think when this whole business started, I, I was right there in front saying, no, this isn't right if we do this. And I warned years ago, I warned about this. You can even probably find it on this channel. I said, if we do this, we've lost it all. If, if you start here, this acid eats everything. So I'm going to give you some things to think about. Southern Poverty Law Center wants to say that, look, it was during the turn of the century, uh, a little after that, and then during the civil rights when these Confederate monuments went up. Therefore, uh, they're there to racism. So that's their logic. They can't find monument plaques um, or dedications that say that it's to racism. So we're just going to say because it was in these eras when there was uh, you know, a lot of racism, there's a lot of, you know, there's lynching during the first part of the 19th, 1900s, uh, or rather 20th century. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're during the civil rights movement, more of them went up. Well, here's a comparison. Here is when Northern monuments went up. Now, remember, Northerners had a lot more money. They could build these things quicker, uh, soon, sooner after the war. But this is a, a survey of Union monuments and a survey of Confederate monuments. And you look, they, it also spikes. There's also more Union monuments being built at the same time. Were those Union monuments to racism? Well, no. No, that's not what their monument plaque. They say the same things to preserving the union in their, you know, for their cause. Or they would say, you know, those who didn't come back home, sacrifice, honor, those kinds of things. So Confederate monuments went up after the war uh, when people could finally, when the South was finally in a state where they could actually purchase these things. And uh, when the memory of these guys is being erased because they're dying. Confederate soldiers are starting to die now. And so their children, their grandchildren want to honor them. And so that's why they went up. And then you have in the 60s, a little little bitty spike. And that's because it was 100 years after the Civil War. So we're remembering that event and putting up monuments to dedicate. It's not because of civil rights. There's no reason to think that. So this, this is a, a complete eisegetical um, interpretation of history. Why were Civil War monuments erected? I want to read you this. This is in 1890. This is from an article that is linked in the info section by Philip Lee. In 1890, the Mississippi legislature voted on a bill to appropriate $10,000 for a Confederate monument. The vote in the lower chamber was 57 to 41 in favor. All six black representatives voted yay. All six of them. Okay, why, why are these black people voting for a Confederate monument? Well, here's the explanation. One, John F. Harris. So it's John, his name is John Harris made a supporting speech prior to the vote. 
And this is what he said. Mr. Speaker, I have risen here in my place to offer a few words on the bill. I was sorry to hear the speech of the young gentleman from Marshall County. I am sorry that any son of a soldier should go on record as opposed to the erection of a monument in honor of the brave dead. And sir... I am convinced that had he seen what I saw at Seven Pines and in the seven days fighting around Richmond, the battlefield covered with the mangled forms of those who fought for their country's honor, he would not have made that speech. When the news came that the South had been invaded, that those men went forth to fight for what they believed, and they made no requests for monuments, but they died, and their virtues should be remembered. Sir, I went with them. I too wore the gray. The same color my master wore. We stayed four long years, and if that war had gone on till now, I would have been there yet. I want to honor those brave men who died for their convictions. When my mother died, I was a boy. Who, sir, then acted the part of a mother to me, an orphan slave boy, but my old missus? Were she living now, or could speak to me from those high realms where are gathered the sainted dead, she would tell me to vote for this bill. And, sir, I shall vote for it. I want it known to all the world that my voice is given in the favor of the bill to erect a monument in honor of the Confederate dead. It's coming from a black man, a black veteran, a soldier who fought for the Confederacy. In Mississippi, all six of the black representatives in the legislature voted for the erection of this monument. Philip Lee says, Harris was about 30 years old when he went off with his master to fight on the side of the Confederacy. After the war, he studied law at the offices of Percy and Yerger in Greenville, Mississippi. The firm's co-founder was William Alexander Percy, a former Confederate colonel. In 1867, Percy successfully defended ex-slave Holt Collier, who had been accused of murdering a federal officer. Strange turn of events, <laughs> this is, uh, for our modern minds to conceive of. Holt Collier was the man who helped Theodore Roosevelt uh, go on a bear hunt. And that's from, we get the legend, the teddy bear from that bear hunt. If your child has a teddy bear, it's because of Holt Collier and the hunt that he took Theodore Roosevelt on. Holt Collier was a black Confederate soldier, had been. And he was accused of, of murdering someone who was federal. A union, well, after the war, but, uh, you know, federal, federal soldier. And a Confederate is the one defending him. An ex-Confederate colonel is the one defending him. And of course, this, this legislature, John Harris, ends up working for that Confederate man. And he was an ex-Confederate, a black Confederate as well. And he voted, and his speech tells you why he supported the erection of this particular monument. It's because of virtue. It's because of the sacrifice they made. It wasn't because of racism. And obviously, coming from him, he wouldn't have voted for it if he thought that. He had a choice. Why were they erected? What was the authorial intent of the blue and the gray? It was to honor those who sacrificed. And it's not really more complicated than that. Here's a statue. This was one that was ripped down in North Carolina. You can actually go to my website. I wrote a whole uh, thing about this because I had gone to the protesters and talked with them for three hours before this was ripped down and, um, and reasoned with them. And I, I tell that story. But here's the dedication plaque. This is the Silent Sam Memorial in North Carolina. It was there. Uh, in at Chapel Hill, and it says, To the sons of the university who entered the war of 1861-65 to 65, in answer to the call of their country, and whose lives taught the lesson of their great commander, who is Robert E. Lee, that duty is the sublimest word in the English language. And of course, you have a simple soldier uh, holding a, a musket, and he's um, it, there's a little um, sort of depiction underneath, and the depiction is basically it's Virginia or North Carolina saying drop your books drop your studies and go defend me and and the soldier did and um and so you know th this is to the common man this is to the soldier and it was to duty that was the reason it doesn't say to slavery it doesn't say to racism it says to duty that's the reason a lot of people died here's the Robert E. Lee monument in Richmond Virginia and I'm saying this Telling you this on the day that uh, it was last was last week that I think they got rid of the Stonewall Jackson monument. They now have gotten rid of the Jeb Stewart monument. It's all coming down. But here's what the Lee um, monument, why it was erected in the first place. This is uh, from a book uh, put out by the U.S. Department of the Interior, National Park Service, 1992, on the history and architecture of Monument Avenue in Richmond. 
Here's what it says. Colonel Archer Anderson gave a much admired dedicatory address to the unveiling that diplomatically skirted the moral and political import of a monument to the leader of a failed rebellion in defense of slavery. Okay, so you see the PC stuff coming in here. But, but listen, Anderson eulogized instead Lee's character and virtues, his skill as a military strategist, his steadfastness and compassion in the face of impossible odds. He ended his speech with an exhortation drawn from deep within the neutral territory of the Lee cult of personality. He said, let this monument then teach to generations yet unborn these lessons of his life. Let it stand not a record of civil strife, but as a perpetual protest against whatever is low and sordid in our public and private objects. So what's he saying? I'll tell you what the National Park was saying. The National Park was saying, they're saying, yeah, you know, this was a war to slavery. That, that's the reason this was fought. So, so, but, but he just decided not to talk about that. Well, I'm sure in his mind, he was, he was there to talk about Robert E. Lee and who Robert E. Lee was. And he did. He talked about this man's character. He didn't talk about slavery. He didn't talk about um, racism. He talked about who Robert E. Lee was. And because people don't understand who he is anymore, they don't study him and the, the good points of his character, of course his statue's coming down. And of course Washington's will follow because George Washington isn't being studied anymore either. And George Washington had slaves as well. George Washington was upset when the British pulled out of New York and took slaves with them. He said, that's the property of us. That's, that's United States property. Those that belong to New Yorkers. How long is George Washington going to stand? Let me ask you. That's why the Lee Monument was erected in the first place. You can see a little postcard from Richmond, Virginia, and that's what it looks like. Well, here's what it looks like today. This is on July 1st. A friend of mine was in Richmond. He took some pictures for me. I don't think I can bear to go myself. It um, has profanity all over it. It is completely, um, it is just completely covered in all kinds of uh, graffiti, etc., and right by the statue, and this is interesting, you probably didn't see this reported, is a radical library. Take a book, book, leave a book. So this is a radical library, and it's supposed to be, hey, here are the reasons that we're doing what we're doing. This is why we're trying to take down these statues. This is why we're vandalizing, why we're breaking the law. Read these books. You know what was in those books? What was in these? And I don't know what all the books were, but one of them, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander was in this, my, my friend told me. And it, it's interesting, the last week I'm critiquing um, Phil Vischer, who, you know, created VeggieTales, and most of his research, supposedly, was based on The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. The same book that's being used here, that's, being, that's in this free library to explain to people why they're desecrating the Lee Monument. You think Christians are partnering with people who are breaking the law and doing bad things? Yeah. Yeah, they're part of the revolution. Here's a monument that came down in North Carolina recently. This is the North Carolina Women of the Confederacy Monument. And you can see, it just says to the North Carolina Women of the Confederacy, you have on the side, uh, there is a mother sending her sons off to war. On the other side are her sons coming back and one of them is being carried because he's dead. And the mother is taking this dead son into her arms. And it's recognizing the sacrifice that mothers made in sending their soldiers away. It was taken down because it's supposedly racist. Nothing about racism, nothing about slavery, but it was taken down. I mean, do you get the point? I hope you do. I've seen hundreds of these things and they all pretty much say very similar things to honor, to bravery, to these intangible principles, these virtues that we could use a lot more of today. They weren't too bigotry. They represent bigotry to a modern audience who has been conditioned to think that they're they represent bigotry. But at the time, even people who were might have been bigoted, who put them up, that's not what it meant to them. It meant, it, it represented eternal values. Or it was to men who exemplified eternal values, which were to be emulated. That's why they were put up. That's what they are about. And if you destroy authorial intent, like most, like many Christians have done, um, like many Christians are doing, uh, I, I even wrote, uh, I wrote two articles. Uh, I'm going to link those in the info section. You can go read them. I wrote one about Lottie Moon, and I wrote one um, about the situation in Mississippi. I'll actually pull this up. 
while I'm talking. And they were both uh, meant to kind of awaken people to understand what the deeper issues of this battle really are. Um, and the reason for that is because the if we as Christians start going down this route, we're going to be in trouble. I mean, Martin Luther did not want stained glass windows broken during the Reformation. He said, that's the poor people's Bible. They need that. Don't just break those things. Yeah, it was set up by Catholic, Roman Catholics. Don't break them. Um, he, was not, he wasn't a revolutionary in that sense. Let me talk to you about the Mississippi flag real quick. This came down recently, and a lot of my family's from Mississippi, so I've always been used to going down to family reunions, and this is the flag that I see. Well, not anymore. Lincoln Duncan made a speech about it, and I'm not going to go through his whole speech. I wrote about it. You can go check that out. But ultimately, what he does is he ignores the very reason the flag was put there in the first place. And I said, look, if you want to take it down, take it down at a different time for a better reason than this. There might be reasons to take it down. So you got a better idea of what represents Mississippi. That's fine. But don't do it in the pressure cooker of social justice warriors want us to take it down um, and, and be bullied into it, which is what Lincoln Duncan's encouraging. But he ignored the very reason the flag was there in the first place. And what was that? Well, we find it in uh, Governor Stone's daughter. She, and this Governor Stone is the one who dedicated this flag. She said, the motivation in incorporating in 1894 this design was to the memory of valor and courage of those brave men who wore the gray. That's it. The valor and courage wasn't to slavery, wasn't to Jim Crow or anything else. It was to the valor and courage of men. And if we let this acid keep eating, we're going to get rid of everything. John Calvin, you want to talk about him? You want to talk about uh, what he thought of civil penalties for those who might have even slightly disagreed on theology? You want to talk about John Knox and misogyny? You want to talk about Martin Luther and anti-Semitism? I guess be prepared to just get rid of all the reformers because they won't meet the standard. Uh, you know, you're honoring them just because you, you, hate, you hate Jewish people and you hate women, I guess, right? reform people. I mean, come on. If you go with this logic here, what's to, what, what's going to help you escape that logic being applied to your own heroes? We already see it being applied to Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. How about Lottie Moon? Lottie Moon is a patron saint of the Southern Baptist Convention. But you, you want to know a few things about Lottie Moon? Lottie Moon was born on a 1,500-acre tobacco plantation. Her father was the largest slaveholder, 52 slaves, in uh, the county where she was born, which is near Charlottesville. She uh, never apologized for her privilege. In 1875, she said um, that where the Caucasian goes, he carries energy, and an inferior race is aroused by the contact. In 1876, Moon claimed that self-respect compelled her to reject any potential decision of any Chinaman or body of Chinamen to determine the place of her ministry. And she likened such an affront to an African church in Richmond telling Dr. Warren, who, who I think is probably Dr. Edward Warren, who had been the medical inspector for the Army of Northern Virginia, Robert E. Lee's army. And she says it would be like them telling Dr. Warren where he could live. Lottie Moon's sister was uh, served as a Confederate Army nurse during the war. In 1876, Moon talked about another missionary, Mrs. Holmes, who didn't want to move and abandoned her duty to these poor heathen, but knew her son Landrum needed to go to the United States. The boy would likely live in, with Methodist relatives who had Northern political sentiments, Northern. So she tried to create an arrangement because Holmes was not willing to subject her boy to that. And Lottie Moon understood that. Lottie Moon wanted to help her avoid Northerners. Uh, in addition, Moon said Chinese funeral processions contained barbaric pomp and show in 1884. Two years later, she proclaimed concerning China, the life here, as we Western people consider it, is exceedingly narrow and contracted. Constant contact with people of a low civilization and many disgusting habits is a trial to one of refined feelings and taste. In 1907, Moon opined that a large reunion of Confederate veterans must have been pleasant. And I'm sure there's more. That's just my little bit of research, primary source research on Lottie Moon and some of the things she said. Do we cancel the Lottie Moon offering? I mean, the Southern Baptists have collected $1.5 billion through the Lottie Moon offering. Maybe they should return all of it. Maybe that's racist money. Under the current logic, why not? Why not cancel Lottie Moon? Why not tear down the idol? And, and, and things are coming down everywhere, but we've given them the logic to do it because we've gotten away from authorial intent. We've gotten away 
from how to understand history in context as human stories, as complex human stories, honoring the things that are worth honoring. And now we've gotten, we, we, we put everything under the microscope and if we find one little flaw that doesn't comport to today's values, egalitarian, egatari- let me say the word, egalitarian values, there we go. We, we get rid of it, we dismiss it. It's not worth it. So that's where we are today. Canceling a monument to mothers and maternal love. This goes beyond monuments. Here's a museum that was destroyed or vandalized, the Daughters of the Confederacy Museum in Richmond. And unfortunately, I um, have knowledge that several historical artifacts, letters from Stonewall Jackson, flags that were actual Civil War flags destroyed, completely destroyed. Here's a cemetery, an actual cemetery that was vandalized. It's not just going after monuments, it's going after anything that represents this era of history. Here's a picture of people trying to take down the Andrew Jackson Monument in near the White House. What are the motives? What are the motives of these revolutionaries? Here's what I think. Here's what they lack. Here's what they don't have. They don't have a respect for the dead. They don't have the ability to make moral separations, to realize that some men have flaws in some areas and we can put up monuments to them without saying, you know, acknowledging that those flaws are, are good somehow or presenting them in a positive way. We can acknowledge other things about them that are worth honoring. They, um, they lack the value for intrinsic virtue. And, and I, what this means is someone who is actually virtuous, whose character is virtuous, and the, the idea that we should honor that person, they don't have that conception. They don't conceive. No one's virtuous in the social justice world. The, the only virtue is whether you're going to go along with the revolution and give your consent to it. So posting on social media, the Black Lives Matter, that there's some virtue associated with that, but that's not intrinsic virtue. That doesn't say anything about your character. It might say you just don't want to get beaten up. Virtue has been eliminated. There is no um, like virtue in the biblical sense or even the platonic sense of there's, there's actual character qualities to strive for. doesn't exist, not in, not in this world. Another thing they lack, sense of eternal judgment. They think that everything must be judged here on this earth because there is no afterlife where things will be judged. So they must take it in their hands to punish all evil because if they don't do it, it won't happen. And those who got away with it, well, we'll take down their monuments at least. Here's what they want. They want to separate people from their cultural identity. They want to destroy reminders of social duty and intrinsic worth. What do I mean by social duty? Monuments, just just like if you have a wedding ring. If you have a wedding ring, it's a reminder of a duty. It's a monument to a commitment that was made, a promise. Monuments also can show commitments. They can show social duty. They can show this is who we are as a people. We're supposed to be acting like that guy. That's George Washington. And this is what he represented and why that monument was put there. He sacrificed a lot for this country. He could have been the king and he decided not to be the king. He was a a humble servant, servant leader. And that's who we need to be as Americans. And there's a social duty when you all recognize that's the character to follow. They don't believe in that. They want to get rid of that idea. They want to erase Christian interpretations of history. And by that, I mean just the idea that there's providential, that there's there's a providence in history. They look at history as, as I explained earlier, this march towards equity of some kind. That's all history is. And there's a lot of bad guys and a few good guys, but more and more, even the good guys aren't good anymore because they don't match the current uh, idea of equity. Equity keeps progressing in its definition. So they a providential view that says, hey, you know, the past, the present, all times, God, there, there was something, God was doing something, was working something. Even in the 1800s, God was still at work. There were still good things happening because men of every time period have sin and men today aren't any better than men were 100 years ago because we're all men. They want to destroy that idea. They want to say we're better. It's pride. They want to enter an earthly totalitarian utopia based on abstract equity, inclusion, and diversity. That's what they're going for. They want a world made in their image. They don't believe in heaven and judgment coming after this life. They're setting up heaven here on earth. And it's equality. That's what they think heaven is. Everyone gets to express themselves sexually the way they want without any guilt. Any reminder of someone who didn't believe in that will be canceled because we want to do what we want to do. 
with our bodies. And we don't want any national allegiance or social attachments that would keep us back from doing that, from doing what we want to do. And the world that we're creating is not based on intrinsic virtue. It's not based on honor and sacrifice. And it's based on things that are <laughs> inclusion, diversity, equity. These are things uh, that are top down. Everyone just must conform to this standard. It's not something that comes from, from the bottom up. It's not something that comes from, from down here and makes its way into families and communities and creates a culture. They, they, want, they want it to come from up here and the federal government's going to, or, or a globalist government is going to impose these things. That's the world they want. And conservatives, like I said, have been compromising. They joined in, the uh, neoconservatives, I should say, they joined in against Confederate monuments because they thought it was a compromise to save the other American monuments. If we give them that, they'll give us Washington. No, they won't. No, they won't. In fact, you just encourage them. They compromised because it was an attempt to prove that they were virtuous and progressive. Uh, Southerners do this a lot. You know, hey, look, we're, we've, we're not the Confederacy anymore. We're, we've progressed past that. We are going to join with you. We're going to take this down. Or we're going to stand by and let it happen. We're not going to say anything. Because we want you to let you know we're okay with that. <laughs> That's going to eat away at everything. Fear of being canceled or labeled a racist was another reason to compromise. How many of you will lose your job if you stand up for these symbols or monuments? They compromise because of, because of the opportunity to promote the Republican myth and engage in identity politics. Well, look, we're against these things too because they were Democrats and we're going to bash Democrats over the head. doesn't work, guys. Can, can I tell you why this doesn't work? Just real briefly. If you say the Democrat Party, they're the party of the Klan. You don't want to vote for the party of the Klan, right? So, oh, no, I don't want to do that. So vote for Republicans. All you have to do is get one CNN journalist to go to a Klan meeting. And you need that journalist. All you need is that journalist to ask them, who are you voting for? And for them to say Trump. And then it, your whole argument's done. Oh, by the way, CNN journalists have done this. <laughs> you can look it up online. You can go to YouTube, type in Klan Donald Trump and find Klansmen. You can even find people like David Duke voting for Donald Trump. That argument is a terrible argument. How about you make this kind of an argument? Vote for the Republican Party. Vote for Republicans because you know what? They believe in the free market. They're going to give you opportunity to control your own life and not have your life dictated to you from someone else. Uh, they're going to be hard on crime. They believe that we should have police because people are evil. So crime needs to be held down. Uh, they're against abortion. You know who's killing more black people than anyone else? Planned Parenthood. We're going to try to stop that. Make that kind of an argument. Make the argument of what you're going to do in the here and now. Don't go play identity politics with people's ancestors. It's stupid. It's foolish. It won't work. But I've seen Republicans now want to do it just as much as Democrats. We're both playing politics with each other's ancestors. We're both trying to say, no, our, our party's on the right side of history. Our group's on the right side of history. History wasn't made. History's the past. It already happened. Learn from it. Don't use it as a battering ram in a political debate. That's where we are, though. We're in an age of ideology, and that's what happens in an age of ideology. I think this is what conservatives are doing. These are some houses near the Lee Monument. Uh, three, four, five, six. There's about seven of them here, I think. Um, I'm not, I think these are all separate houses, but this was taken by a friend of mine who uh, was there at Lee Circle, and these are the houses surrounding it. And you know what most of them all say, if not all of them? Black Lives Matter. It's kind of like when the children of Israel didn't want the angel of death coming. They painted the ram's blood right over the doorpost. I mean, that's what they're doing. They're saying, hey, look, don't come damage my house. I mean, there's, there's in one of these pictures, a fence is being repaired. There was some damage to some of these old historical houses. They're saying, hey, we, we agree with you. We're with you. We stand with you. One of them even says that. We stand with you. Black lives matter. That's what conservatives are trying to do today. They're saying, look, don't cancel me. I'm, I'm just as angry about slavery and Jim Crow and racism as you are. Don't come to my house, please. Black Lives Matter, I'm with you. Cowards. That's what that is, cowards. Who are okay with a whole generation being lied to about their history, about the past, about monuments, etc. They're cowards. But that's who we're surrounded by. 
You know who seems to get it more than anyone else? And I almost hate to say that. I did not vote for Donald Trump in 2016, but he gets this. This is from Snopes, 2017, three years ago, Donald Trump. So this week, it's Robert E. Lee. I noticed that Stonewall Jackson's coming down. I wonder, is it George Washington next week? And is it Thomas Jefferson the week after? You know, you really do have to ask yourself, where does it stop? Jefferson was a major slave owner. Are we going to take down his statue? This is President Trump, August 15th, 2017. Well, what did Snopes say about it? He said, well, he, he's engaging in whataboutism. And this is what they said. So what about them? Must they all go if Robert E. Lee goes? Not necessarily, because they are all not, not the same. Some figures stood for something larger. Washington guided the foundation of a country that eventually preserved freedom for all. Jefferson authored a Declaration of Independence in which a single phrase that all men are created equal became a hammer that later smashed, that later generations would help, use to help smash the chains of slavery. So what, see what they're trying to do? They're drawing a line. They're saying Trump doesn't know what he's talking about. This was back in three years ago. Now we see Trump knew exactly what he was talking about. But they're saying, no, Trump doesn't know what he's talking about. Because look, Washington and Jefferson, I mean, these guys, obviously, they stood for something larger. Lee just stood for, for, for slavery. Except he didn't. He's the hero of the Mexican-American War. Only guy not to get a demerit at West Point. He was the president of Washington College after the war. And during the war... He was not for slavery. I read you that quote in a previous episode. I showed you what Lee thought about slavery. He didn't like it. He wanted it abolished progressively. He thought that was the best way to do it. It was the Christian way to do it. Robert E. Lee inherited slaves. He didn't even go, he didn't go purchase slaves. He inherited some. And to care for them because they wouldn't have made it, and I've read several Lee biographies, he was concerned they would not have made it if they were to be freed, and he couldn't have made it financially if they were freed anyway. Um, he, he kept them, and he freed them as soon as he could. He did not like slavery. Uh, he wasn't fighting for slavery. He was fighting. You know why he was fighting? What Robert E. Lee represents? Robert E. Lee was fighting because he did not want to raise his sword, his saber, against his state or his family or his people. That's what Robert E. Lee stands for. Loyalty to family. Loyalty to local community and area. And will not raise his sword against them. Show some guts. Robert E. Lee, there's some that think this. I've read this. He, he could have been president after the war. He was offered to be the, the, pre, the, the figurehead, the, the mascot, essentially, but the president of banks in New York. Uh, there were people interested in having him run for office. I mean, he was a hero in the North and the South. And he said, no, I'm going to help the next generation of Southern men be men in this horrible economy, this horrible situation. I need to help them. That was Robert E. Lee. An honorable man. Didn't run around on his wife. An honorable man. That's what he stood for. It was so much more than, oh, he was just the general of the, the, the Confederacy, and the Confederacy was all about slavery. No, he was defending Virginia. Virginia didn't even secede because of slavery. It wasn't the primary motivation. They seceded later, after other states seceded in the Lower South, because Lincoln was invading. Have people even bothered to check the historical record to see if what they're saying is true? No. But the social justice warriors, all they need is one fact that's politically incorrect, and that's it. That person or statue is canceled. We're not ready for it, guys. You know who gets it, though? The only person that seems to sort of get it is Donald Trump. And I'm not saying that because I'm a big Trump fan. I'm just calling it as I see it. Trump's the only one that knew this acid would eat into everything else. So... That's my, that's my, this is my episode on monuments. I know it's long and, and some of you like the long episodes. Some of you like shorter episodes. Um, so hopefully those who like the longer ones enjoyed this mega edition. Uh, but I think this is important. We need to be talking about this and, um, and I will be releasing some more material on this issue, but we're going to talk about other issues as well. There's a lot to talk about and I'm just grateful for all of your support. And I want you to remember this. No matter, even if they burned the Declaration of Independence and Washington, D.C. was burned to the ground and the whole history of your country was gone, it still lives. And it lives in here and in here. And if you are a citizen of the United States of America who studies this history and loves this history and loves the North, the South, the East, the West, like I do, every part of this country, 
then you can still teach your kids, even if there aren't monuments around. They help, they're teaching, they're, they're opportunities to teach, but you don't need them. You as a parent can teach your kids, which is why for patrons, for those who uh, $5 uh, or more a month, if you go for, it's one of the first links in the info section at the bottom, if you wanna go and um, sign up and contribute to my work, you will get a free copy, if you give me your address, of Understanding the War Between the States, uh, authored by, uh, I believe it's, I forget how many, 20 Southerners or so, Southern historians, but um, it's, I, I give out different books. I've, I've given out, uh, I'm trying to even think what books I've given out. There's been a bunch of them. Um, I think I, the last one I gave out was on the Founding Fathers, but this one is on um, the war between the states and understanding why, did, why was there a civil war. And I want you to, to read this because I think it's a good secondary source. I think, uh, and, and of course, you know, it's not, nothing's perfect. It's not exhaustive, but it's, it's, uh, was meant to be a high school textbook. And I'm finding out that a lot of people just don't even have a basic high school understanding of, of our own history. And so I want to give that to you for free. If you send me your address and if you sign up to be a patron, I will give that to you. Uh, for some more resources on monuments, check out the info section. There's a great speech. Um, by a gentleman named Aaron Wolf. Aaron Wolf is someone who died very recently. I met him before he died, and he gave a speech, I think it was in 2018 or 17, I think it was 2018 when he gave the speech, but uh, it is an excellent speech on this issue, and it, it's the war on memory, and, and he really understands uh, why this motivation was there. He died on, I believe it was Easter of last year, and um, what a great man. Um, he was the, uh, I think, the editor-in-chief of Chronicles Magazine, and, and you can go check that out, though. He speaks from the grave, and you can hear what he has to say. There's some other resources there, and you can read those if you're, more inter if you're interested in following this further. But uh, once again, thank you for your support. Thank you for listening. God bless.